As far as I know, the most researched thing that helps people get out of pain is time. I think an injury should be a sign to, okay, let's get past this injury and let's tackle this again. Pain signals travel very slowly. You stick your hand on the hot frying pan and then two seconds later you're like, ow! You pull your hand off, you shake, shake. The pain disappears while you're shaking. The minute you stop shaking, oh, it hurts again. Pain is the negative emotional response to irritation. I felt something. I did not like that. Well, first of all, if I'm a, a high jumper, I want tight hamstrings. Now the question is, do I need that mitigated to manage back pain? The problem is that they go from that back under the bar. And, and that's the problem. There's there's no ramp up, graded exposure to the movement that was once painful. Question, Leviathan lifts. I've been dealing with low back pain following oh, no, my last um, powerlifting meet three weeks ago and still am feeling pretty beat now. What advice would you guys have for someone like me to get back on the saddle and get out of pain? I would say, see if you can learn how to tuck your hips underneath you. You can do this, uh, you can get up against a wall and you're not really doing like a wall sit necessarily, but the knees could be bent a little bit. You can also do this on the floor, um, but they're kind of two different drills <clears throat> on the floor or up against the wall and just get your spine as flat as you can get it. Uh, on the wall or get your spine as flat as you can get it on the ground. Um, you may want to try to work on breathing a particular way to try to almost kind of suck the stomach in, draw your belly button like inward. Um, you also might want to try some different things with your arms and your hands, um, reaching your arms out, reaching your hands out, um, reaching your, your feet out, you know, bent, you can, um, what you do is you pick up your feet while you're lying on your back. Uh, your knees are bent at like a 90 degree angle your, and your elbows are bent as if you're going to do like those twists that you see some people do when they're doing Like setups. dead bugs, yeah. Like dead bugs. There you go. And um, just press that lower back as a drill into the ground. And Now just if you've had severe lower back pain for a long time, even that could be painful. So just kind of... Uh, just do little bouts of it and get used to it before you go and just try to do that. But I would say uh, try to hold those positions for 30 seconds, maybe like a minute. You can also take an exercise ball and put it between the elbows and the knees and you can kind of crunch in on that. But I think, in my opinion, opposite pressure a lot of times can really help. So there's been you know people talking about, oh, if you train your abs, you fix your back. If you train your abs, it kind of stretches your lower back. But I think a lot of times what puts our lower back in some pain, not all the time, but sometimes it's just kind of chronically being like tonic. It's like uh, chronically flexed and it's a little tight. And for a lot of people, their hips are shifted back. A lot of athletes are like that, especially power lifters. Mm. And so just see if you can get that to calm down. I, I've been messing with that for maybe about a year and I got all the tension out of my lower back. You know, I think... I, I'm actually curious what you guys think about this because um, the lower back is something that for me was really tight for a while. Now I have all sorts of movement through my back, but at, over time, as I was trying to, I guess, get movement there, I was doing a lot of long range rows. I was doing a lot of movements. I would periodically have slight tweaks, slight muscle pulls in the back, mm -hmm. right? Where it's be like, I'd, I'd pull something, I'd be like, fuck. And then I'd be really stiff for a while. But after that happened, we've talked about this before, I would just make sure to tell my brain that, okay, it's okay to move. Just try, even if it would hurt, I would try to get out of the car in a normal way. I would try to pick something up in a normal way, still allowing myself to bend. It would heal up, then it would feel better. I had maybe three or so slight pulls, uh, and then I haven't had a pull in a very, very long time. And I've had all this range of motion and looseness in my lower back. I still have the, creative, the ability to create tightness, but now I have the ability to like really move there. But I wonder, because I think a lot of people, there was another question in the lower back in here. I wonder if part of the process of being able to get a lot of movement back there is at times a little injury might happen. What do you guys think about that? Because I think as, as anyone starts trying to do some of the stuff we're talking about, you might injure yourself. Mm. But I don't honestly think that should that injury should be the reason to tell yourself this is dangerous, I can't do this. If you do tell yourself this is dangerous and you can't do that, then you're going to end back at square one. Mm. I think an injury should be a sign to, okay, let's get past this injury and let's tackle this again. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think pain is something to try to uh, examine and to 
investigate further. You yeah. know, so you're like you move to the side or sometimes when your back hurts, if you if you go backwards, you know, you put your hands kind of on your waist and you go backwards, sometimes mm -hmm. that kills or going back to one side kind of hurts. I would investigate and try to figure out maybe don't maybe don't keep doing that same movement, but try to figure out like why does that area hurt so much? Mm -hmm. I think would be a good idea. But Andrew is a back scientist at this point <laughs> because he has has uh, had some back injuries in the past and he's doing a lot better nowadays. Yeah. I mean, I wish I had uh, like a better formulated, you know, like... Do this thing. These yeah. These seven things it's, and you're going to be great. It's so different for so many people. But what you were kind of uh, alluding to in SEMA, like I, I had back pain and everything was don't do all these things because it's going to aggravate your back and it's going to hurt worse mm -hmm. it it wasn't until like i don't know not too long ago where i was like okay what happens if my back hurts and like i i would lay down because like laying down flat killed my back mm -hmm. in that moment it killed my back even sound like hearing myself say that is like okay it wasn't killing you it just was very uncomfortable but i lay down on my back and i'm like okay it hurts where does it hurt? Why does it hurt? What's going on here? And I took a deep breath and then my back popped and then the pain went away. Now, obviously when I got up, the pain came back, but it was like, Oh shit. Like this is crazy. I've never even just sat here and explored like the pain. And a lot of people I think are so scared of the back pain that they won't do that. They won't get into the, the movement or the, the positions that will like just tap the, the pain a little bit like, Oh, okay. So that causes that. Okay, what what if I do this? And it's okay, that's cool. All right, cool. I got one. They'll completely avoid it. Um, so for me, it was definitely that one day in SEMA was like, uh, what happens if you like bend down and touch your shoes or whatever? He was standing behind me, so it's kind of weird. But I was like, Oh yeah, nothing. Boom, I did it. And then I was like, But if I grab my phone and I go to put it on a desk, it's painful. I'm like, why? Well, what the heck? Like, what is that? And it's just like, it was a, it was a very big mental thing for me. Um, and then my like one, two step with like how I kind of like reversed a lot of the, the issues I was having was uh, the first step was go to um, getting into that back chain and kind of helping my posture. And then the way I walked, um, I think, uh, what is it flexing the back when you, when you get into your like you're arching your spine or I don't, I don't know what the extension extension. Is yeah, that what it is? This is okay. So getting into extension for whatever reason, created space in my lower back to make the pain go away. So I was able to always find a spot where I can be like, okay, cool. The pain de dissipated, but I wasn't getting out of pain. Uh, we had a movement doc, Robbie Ellis. He was the one that instructed me like, cool, you got there. Now let's try stretching it out the other way, which is stuff that Mark had always told me, but I was like, dude, that hurts too much. Like I can't do it, but now I kind of got some pain relief. So let me go the other way. So I went the other way, did some breath work, you know, worked on the diaphragm and all that stretching it the other way helped get me out of pain. So go to kind of stop the pain going the other way and stretching out doing what you were saying mark getting my back flat on the ground yeah and inflection yeah. yeah that's what like essentially made it possible for me to do jujitsu and you know kind mm -hmm. of move forward and not be a person with back pain anymore now does my back still have some sensations yes but i can move around now like i was doing the stuff that david weck's been showing earlier in the gym i was doing that and it's freaking phenomenal. It feels so good that I can go in, feel a little tight, leave the gym being like, dude, I'm ready to go. Like, I, I feel fantastic. So I would say, you know, avoid some things that hurt on a scale of one to 10 that are above a three, but also investigate those things, you know? So like, Perfect. if you go to deadlift and you're like a deadlift, like a six or a seven out of 10, well, let's remove that style of deadlifting from your workouts for a little while, but yeah. let's also examine that particular movement. And maybe there's a version of it you could do, or maybe there's a, some sort of strengthening or stretching, or there's something mm -hmm. could be glutes, could be a uh, myofascial release, but um, just, just try not to do stuff that's real dangerous for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean only dangerous in the moment. I just mean dangerous with the particular thing that you have now. 
But again, you do need to kind of go down that road and investigate it at least a little bit uh, to see what your body's going to be able to handle. This is similar to Chiropractic Family. We talk about eating meat all the time on this podcast. Pause. Pause. But sometimes you might want to eat some different meat. Pause. You might want to eat duck, chicken, <laughs> Japanese A5 Wagyu. You might want to change things up. That's why we've partnered with Good Life Proteins, which also has certified Piedmontese beef on their website. Now, all you have to do is head to goodlifeproteins.com and you can select build a box with all of the proteins that you want. Then you'll select subscribe and save to save money on all of your meat. Pause. Enter code POWERPROJECT to save an extra 5% on any subscription you select. So if you want to get your beef every two weeks, you'll be able to save 25% on all of your meat. Again, that's goodlifeproteins.com. Links are in the description along with the podcast show notes. So I think you have a really hard job, you know, being someone that's trying to help people get out of physical pain. Because as far as I know, the most researched thing uh, that helps people get out of pain is time. And so the doctor is saying, hey, you should take some time off. Kind of makes some sense in some ways. Because, Andrew, I don't think you – do you have any idea, like, what fixed your back? Mm. Well, I Your mean, back the, is a lot better nowadays. Yeah, yeah. No, it's still – like, I mean, you guys saw me outside doing some David Weck stuff, trying to get that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, decompression in there. Because I, I did – I woke up feeling a little tight, went to jiu-jitsu, everything was fine. Uh, but I got here, and I'm like, yeah, we need to address this. And now I feel great. Um, like, dude, it was, it was the posture stuff with Goda, you know, mm -hmm. learning how to keep my feet straight while walking definitely helped because as I would walk and I'd pick my feet up and I'd, you know, walk how they instructed me, I could feel my back kind of some, some relief with every step. And I was like, Oh, well, this is amazing. Um, and then a movement doc showed me kind of like, okay, now that you're in your back chain, let's go ahead and start stretching it out and get in, you know, and start, uh, what's the opposite of back chain or the front, front, whatever yeah. it may be. That combination helped relieve the pain enough for me to start jujitsu, and then now with jujitsu being on the floor a whole lot more, uh, it's it's been like night and day difference. Yeah, so about a, I don't know, say a year and a half ago, I would have been seeing a different tune probably, maybe even two years ago, and now it's like I feel like I can kind of almost do anything again. So I like that story because you're like seeking out the whole time. Oh yeah, and, and that must be what you run into people seeking relief from pain for sure. And I think you know it's people are. I, you know, if you look at like the research on different things, right, there's, there are some things that are studied pretty well and there's a lot of things that aren't studied very, you know, don't have much research. And I think you hear a lot of stories like this where people, you know, I think that's a good thing for people to think about is if I've got some pain thing, most things in the musculoskeletal system get better with just time. Like mm -hmm. that's probably the best thing to know right away is like most musculoskeletal issues just heal with time. And a lot of practitioners will blame it on their intervention. They'll say, oh, I'm going to take credit. Like it was this thing I did to you. That's what got you better. But Really, if you look at these conditions, they've studied them, you know, they will just, if you track them, and some do go on a long time, sometimes it's six to eight months, but people will just tend to get better. You have a group that you just track them with no intervention and time, and then you have a group where you have interventions. You know, of course, the interventions, the hope is that they will kind of speed things up. And I think you meet a lot of people like yourself where I think it's a good message there, like, you know, be proactive in this process and explore different interventions because there's so many different types of techniques and mm -hmm. tools and things you can try. And if something is giving you some relief, everybody's pain experience is unique and what makes them better is unique. And it depends on where you're at in the healing process. You know, like I said, like, is it, does it have nerve symptoms? Is it just local to your back? And you kind of try to, you think about the research and what things have evidence, but then you're okay with kind of exploring other things as long as, you know, they don't have some negative side effect or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that, then you just try to, but I think it, it, for a lot of people, it is really helpful to just know most things will just get better. And maybe you do have a period of rest because rest usually does desensitize things and help them. And then you just, I think pain and injury rehab is too complicated sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, really, you could break it down to two steps. It's like, let's give this, let's, I'm going to focus in the beginning on trying to get this thing to calm down and desensitize, maybe with a, like a period of rest maybe some soft tissue work and mobility exercises. And then once I've moved out of that phase, I'm going to try to build capacity. And mostly that's going to be with resistance training type things. So I'm going to put load on my system and try to build it back up. So that, that you hear this a lot, like calm it down, build it back up, you know, mm -hmm. and if you can just think about that and just be, try to stay positive and know that most things get better. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say is, um, so like the, 
the I, I calm the pl- the pain down and then I build right back up. But um, I, I do it as like that one two combination because it's really hard for me to explain. And I know how demoralizing it can be when somebody's like, "Dude, how did you you know get out of back pain?" It's like, "Well, shit, how much time do you have?" Like I worked with Stuart McGill. Um, I did a lot of stuff from John Sarno or Cerno Sarno. Um, I, I, breath work helped a lot actually like getting deep into meditation and so all of it kind of came together to help rebuild this back thing but everybody's different and that's what's like really difficult so for yourself like uh, do you find patterns with back pain like is there something that like I've seen this before it's probably going to work again or is it literally everybody like so extremely different that each person is like a brand new page in the book no there's definitely patterns okay yeah, you can kind of lump, you can kind of group people into like, you can start off by saying, oh, this person's kind of more on the hypomobile side of the spectrum. This person's more on the hyper hypermobile. So you can kind of mm-hmm. start looking at that. Like is, there's kind of a spectrum of that, but does this person fit into more of kind of a stiff back, stiff hips or extreme? Like I, when I was, I've worked with contortionists before and like, mm. like that's a very different, like they're very mobile, but that's a lot amazing. of amazing stuff in yourself in like a little box. <laughs> <It's> some crazy <laughs> stuff. Like their lumbar spines were so mobile. You know, so there are like in the physical therapy research, there are kind of these um, clinical practice patterns where you start to look at that. And that's one of the differentiators in the low back. Is this person more on the hypomobile side of the spectrum? Or are they more on the hypermobile side? And and then you start looking at, well, is the pain localized to their back? Maybe it's like their erector muscles. Maybe it's the facet joint, you know, um, maybe it's their SI joint. Is it local to that region or does it have a like a radicular type pain where it travels down usually the buttock and like hamstring region? So, and that will change your process a little bit. But, you know, so you, you definitely see, even though everybody's pain is kind of unique, I don't want to make it sound like, because that could be discouraging to people to think like my back pain is so different and how am I ever going to find a solution? Really, when you start examining people and treating them, um, people do have very similar characteristics and you right off the bat kind of go slightly different directions really based on is it more localized to their back or does it have like a nerve Capa- like quality no, you to don't it. understand my back pain yeah <laughs> mine hurts worse than his yeah, exactly <laughs> it is tricky right though right yeah, you have yeah. to validate that with people because um I, you know, when i was a new pt i used to kind of be more you willing gotta to give sh- them some grace right for sure yeah. i would shoot things down even interventions sometimes <laughs> i'd be like dude there's no research for that you shouldn't even think about that intervention which i was robbing people i shouldn't have done that bro your back doesn't hurt that bad yeah <laughs> Come on. it's all in your head scientifically can't, <laughs> be, can't be that bad oh. what kind of stuff did you shit on though <laughs> well it would be like you know things that i still don't i wouldn't be they wouldn't be my <laughs> first to. pick or even maybe a pick at all for rehab um but you know it'd be like a lot of passive modality type things where people would be like oh, the ultrasound really helps my back and it's like we literally have studies now where they don't turn the machine on and we get the same results. I can picture you uh, <laughs> going out of your office and like screaming into a jar. <laughs> <laughs> and then going back in and be like, you're right, that's great. <laughs> you can totally do that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, like there are studies where they will take a group and have the ultrasound machine turned on and then they'll have a group where they don't turn it on but do the tre- treatment and they get similar. Mm. So it's like there are just, there are interventions that are so placebo driven, Mm. you know, and just have like very zero efficacy. And I think before I would have been like, no, that's bullshit. You shouldn't. But now I realize who cares? Like if it's placebo and it's not hurting them. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. But I'm going to also try to encourage you to do movement and strengthen and work on mobility, not just ultrasound. Maybe they said yoga really hurt, really helped my back. And you might be like, I just ran into three people that it just hurt their back, you yeah. know? But I guess if that's working for you, then yep. amen. Yeah. Right. And it's like who you get, right? Like the, a lot of times it's the coach or the instructor. Like there's plenty of bad PTs. And there are probably people that I'm not a good fit with patient-wise. Like maybe I p- pick an intervention and it flares the person up and they're mm-hmm. like, well, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And they go someone else, go somewhere else and tell him like, this PT did this with me and it made me way worse. So I think... Yoga is that way too. Like a lot of people will get bet. Yoga will help them with back pain. But if you get an instructor who it's a big class, they don't listen to you. It doesn't mean that that particular form of exercise isn't good for back pain. It might just been your particular situation. And I think that's what's tricky with pain in life, right? There's so many variables and it's not a perfect experiment and trying to figure out all what factor was it that triggered the person, what thing helped mm. them. And sometimes that stuff's hard. You kind of are just looking at, do we have a general positive trend over time, knowing there's going to be setbacks? It's not this perfect linear oh, improvement, yeah. but like just 
are you having a general positive trend over time, even though we know you're going to flare up sometimes there's going to be setbacks, but that's kind of what, you know, what you're looking for. When he's given advice, like he can give a lot of advice and people are in pain and people are desperate. Why do you think sometimes there's not follow through, like in your opinion, because since you've seen it firsthand happen so many times? Well, I've seen the, I mean, I will say there is follow through among the injured or people in pain who are mm. able to make change. I mean, I think that we have a lot of people who have a light bulb moment um, when, you know, Kelly literally tells them like, hey, you know, they come with knee pain. And I mean, I can't tell you, even to this day, we will get emails that have like 10 paragraphs where someone's describing their entire medical history. They've seen every specialist on earth for their knee pain. And, and then it actually starts to become part of their identity. Like knee pain is their identity. Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm a knee pain person. And I've accepted that knee pain is what I'm going to experience the rest of my life. Um, and, and to have Kelly actually be able to give them some really simple tools like mobilizing upstream and downstream of your knee and feeding some, some slack into your knee and actually seeing, actually experiencing mm. a change in their pain or their function. I think it's really remarkable for people. I think, and, and I think a lot of people come into it really skeptically. I think they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really, yeah okay. I'm going to do these like five things Kelly told me to it. do with the foam roller or whatever, you know, a ball or a tool or whatever. I think, you know, people do come in skeptically, but I would will say once they experience some change, you know, people are sold. Mm. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately it does seem like the, the most adherent are those who have experienced an injury, have been able to figure out how to solve it on their own or not an injury, but whatever pain, um, you name it, just, they, they've been able to solve a problem. Um, and as a result have been able to do the things they want to do and move better. Um, those are the greatest adherent. And, and again, I think it goes back to the question about you asked earlier about what's the challenge. It's still the challenge of, you know, getting people who aren't in pain, aren't experiencing an injury to want to care now and put a little care and feeding into the system in, in terms of taking care of their body. I mean, I think that's, th but, that's you know, the crew. You, a lot of people didn't stretch or stop stretching because they didn't even see a benefit from it. You know, like it just seemed like a waste of time. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to tell my coach, I'm like, I'm pre-stretched. Fine. Like, I, what, you want me to touch my toes? I can do that. You know, I can sprint cold. Never made the case that I could work harder. I could feel better. That I could improve my times. Like, if as soon as we make it about something that someone cares about, then they're in it. So that's our failure, you know, around this. And, you know, if it's just, you know, every once in a while there's a group of people, like, I, mobilizations are not my thing. They're just a set of tools to restore position. Training and positions and shapes, that's what I get involved in to, to help people sort out. And so there's just this set of tools that you're like, I'm anti-tool. I'm like, okay, well, what tools are you using to solve this set of problems in your athletes? Mm -hmm. Moving more, that's a great tool. But oftentimes, there's still a physiotherapist on your team. I noticed that every you know professional soccer team has five physiotherapists on their team. Why is that? Do you think that they're dumb and wasting their time? Is that is that what it is? So... If you can come up with one reason why this works, like I've heard some people who are super anti-mobility or anti-mobilization, some they're like, well, maybe it allows you to spend time in positions you wouldn't touch normally. I'm like, okay, great. So you just lost the whole argument, right? So, and, and more importantly, if that's for you, the thing that allows you to spend time in shapes, mm -hmm. cool. I think that's really okay. I think it can have multiple bottom lines, but the bottom line comes back to, does it facilitate you working harder in your sport? I can usually show you that there's a net positive for that. And again, it may not be rolling around on a foam roller. One of the things we've been seeing about this book is we're trying to frame it as like a 401k for your body, right? Because you're 30 awesome. and you know, you, you again, like Kelly and I are 50 and we're starting to think about like, what do we want to be able to do when you're, we're 75? You're not. That's actually Mark Bell. People don't know that. That's, <laughs> that's Mark Bell. Um, which, you can which, see it right here. We took the whole idea. Which it's line though? But it's like, you know, we all, we all do, a, we all do a lot of things now in our life where you don't, you you know, it's not immediate gratification, right? Like you put money in your 401k and it's gone and, you know, you hope and assume you're going to have it later when you actually retire. Neither one of these guys are good with money. So yeah, yeah. you might have well, to use a different example. You guys should start a 401k. <laughs> we can talk about that afterwards. Um, but we just think about this as a 401k for your body, right? Like for people who don't. Get yourself a J-star. You know, like oh, I'm available for advising on that, on that okay. later. Financial, financial success. Um, anyway, so that, that's how we like to think about it. We want, we want people to think about like, Hey, I save money and I don't care. You know, I don't get any benefit from it now. And so, you know, taking care of your body a little bit, putting some input, input into your body now is going to if you reap de dividends later in your life. are listening to this podcast, you're not the person we're talking to. We're talking to your family. Mm. 
you're already into all of this stuff. You're into the weird shoes. You're into the the creepy stuff. You're like you you're you're <laughs> you do weird stuff. You stuffed me into a suit so I could squat more. Like I was into it. Like that's weird. Yeah, you were really stuck. I don't in that know. Suit. I, I disagree. This there's a lot of power lifters listening to this podcast, and some power lifters I think could stand to. Sure, all three of them. Puts, that's great. Put some input into their body. So, but the idea here is we want, we think that you can. You're already the node for so much information in your community. You tell people. You give people ideas around training and nutrition and sleep. But really, our our athletes have the real chance to to change their communities and society. They already do, right? They're inspiring their friends to lift. They're they're eating differently. They're talking about nutrition. They're getting blood panels. That's all coming from sport, mm. and. This is an easy way for you to become a super node for people who don't aren't going to exercise, but who do are starting to think about, you know, hey, I want to be able to do all the things I want to do. I think that. one of the things you're talking about, like with people being restless is uh, a lot of people are just in pain. You know, you're just going to like you might not even really realize how many times you fidget in the middle of the night, but it would make sense if you're, you know, if your lower back hurts or your hip hurts or this hurts or that hurts. Your body's really intelligent. Your body's like, man, I don't like laying in this position. Let's go to the other side. And then you go to the other side and the shoulder hurts on that side. And, you, right. you know, you're in, I think a lot of people are in a lot more pain than maybe they even realize. Um, why do you think, why do you think sometimes these things don't register as pain? Uh, you know, for example, if we go to use uh, one of the smaller balls that you have, uh, you know, and we, we put it on our shoulder or, or you, like you had us do our neck. Mm -hmm. Um why do we get a sense of like pain there, but we had no idea that we had an right. issue there at all until you put pressure there? Yeah, I always like to say, you know, the balls don't hurt. They just show you where the hurt is. So until we actually start to um, play with the, the textures of our own tension, we don't realize what little tiny nerves are all trapped up in there or all jumbled up in there or all agglomerated in there um, in terms of, you know, uh, thickened fascia or lack of lack of good contractility in the muscles or um, uh, inflammatory fluids that are just trapped from lack of movement and lack of movement because you're protecting it. So, you know, pain, pain signals travel very slowly, whereas movement travels very fast. And so I just want to address a couple of things that you said. So one of the reasons that the fidgets also... Um, distract us from the pain is because the movement, the brain is like, oh, movement, movement, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. And, and so it's picking up on the movement because those are faster moving signals, whereas pain is a lot slower. You think about, um, you stick your hand on the hot frying pan. This is the classic, right? You stick your hand on the hot frying pan and then two seconds later, you're like, ow, you pull your hand off, you shake, shake. The pain disappears while you're shaking. The minute you stop shaking, oh, it hurts again. And then, and you're like, then you start walking and pacing and you're like, oh my God, water. You're like any other stimulus to change the pain mm -hmm. response. So um, our, our brain is equipped to, to process like pain more slowly than others. But once we do get still, pain starts to really surface. Or once we are probed with a little tiny rubber ball, it's not like a hammer, it's not a, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a, an ice pick, but um, the precision of, uh, sort of locating these different areas of, of stuckness or stagnation or lack of movement, um, we're going to feel the irritants that are in that area. And, and that's why that shows up. Um, and everybody has these spots. I mean, you know, it's like we sleep weird or we, you know, um, had an accident when we were seven and then now we're, now we're 42 and oh my God, my knee clicks all the time. What's that from? It was, well, cause your leg got slammed in the door by your brother and you forgot about it. And now if you're, you know, you had, you've walked weird the rest of your life and now here you are, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, it's like, we ha we have this legacy, uh, that we're walking around with and the, you know, massage has a habit of revealing that stuff. So does movement, right? Movement patterns, you can you know, look at people under the bar or just look at gait, or there's so many different ways to see this, but I love pressure because I feel like it's such a truth teller. Mm. Like you just, it's so direct, yeah. but you can also change it very quickly through different applications or through adjusting your pain pressure threshold. And then you're, you can actually reprogram your brain. Basically, that sounds so tacky. <laughs> reprogram your brain just through um, through retraining and neuroplastic changes so that your brain no longer is holding on to phantom pain that actually isn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the brain just remembers a habit. And so it's keeping tension in an area because, you know, you threw your neck out eight years ago, but there's nothing there there. There's no there there. 
Um, I remember I did, um, uh, Maya Bialik is one of my students and she, we did a, when the book came out, we did an Instagram live and she gets infrequent, very crippling back pain, but has had all the scans. They're all clean. Um, but her psoas locks up. Why? We don't know, but it locks up. And so we addressed the lobe. We did everything that you guys did today, by the way. We mm -hmm. do the, the lateral raffe, the, the lumbar decompression move. Um, we do some other stuff deep in the gut that we didn't do and, and, and some other psoas trickery and some hamstring trickery. And that can really be helpful. But it's like these patterns show up. Sometimes they're not, on, they're not um, biological, they're neurological. The brain is saying, this is my stress pattern. And when I get triggered by life stresses, this is how I protect this being. And so we just have to keep learning to work with that, whether it's our restlessness or whether it's like legit pain that, that puts us, you know, into a, into a non-movement state. Look into my eyes. Now I know that you want to be looking better. You want to be going, walking the streets, being like, damn, I look and feel good. Cause then everyone's going to be looking at you. That's why we've partnered with Viore clothing. So you can stop wearing your ripped up tank and your long shorts and step your athleisure game up. Viore has clothes that you can wear to dinner with a date, or you can wear it in the gym. Personally, some of our favorites are the Ponto performance line. And it has this dream knit fabric trademarked that literally feels like baby skin on your skin. It sounds kind of weird, but when you put it on and feel it, my God, that will change your life. Right here, this is the Boulevard shirt jacket. You guys are always wondering what kind of long sleeves we're wearing. It stretches, it feels good. Oh, Andrew, where can they step their game up? Absolutely. You guys got to head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash power project. And you'll automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. We, we were talking in the gym a lot about, uh, you know, getting out of pain and mm -hmm. you know, what an interesting topic. And there's like so much to try to uncover. I think, you know, one of the things that's really uh, like blurry about pain is that it's really hard to for somebody to uh, communicate on how much something hurts. And then, uh, you know, I don't know about how it is for everybody in here, but a lot of times when I hear someone say something hurts, I'm like, man, they're just complaining. Mm. <laughs> they're being a little bitchy about this thing. But they could legitimately be in a lot of pain to where this thing is annoying them. It's frustrating them so much. Mm. Um but you're trying to relate it to your pain. You're like, oh, I had the same pain like three weeks ago. And I'm like, look at me, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, these uh, pain can, can be psychologically damaging. It can be something that can kind of drag you down. And it seems like you've been somebody who's been able to help a lot of people um, get out of pain, get through pain. What are some of the, uh, how did you kind of get into this field in the first place? Okay. First thing is... I you know, my, my background is in helping people get out of pain through the use of their own body. You know, no medications, no surgeries, none of that. I, I, my, my clinical background is in chiropractic and soft tissue. And my exercise background is exercise physiology as a basically a degree exercise phys plus uh, pre-med in University of Maryland into being a personal trainer since 2004. Like that's, that's my background. And I was never ever, 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 ever the smartest kid in any class. You know, I was, I was the guy who like, what do I need to do to matriculate through to the next level? I'll do that. That's a pretty big word though, matriculate. So, you're ahead matriculate. of the game with that one. <laughs> I wasn't right. the smartest kid, but I matriculated myself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I, I've, I've gained intelligence <laughs> over the years. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. But so, so, you know, it was always, uh, I had this streak of rugged individualism in me. And I never wanted to do things the way other people did them for a long time. If, if for no other reason, personal ego, I wanted to be the guy who could say like, I did that. Yeah. And, and frankly, that helped me back for a really long time. It was having to invent the thing when the thing's already been invented. Mm. If I could just put my own recipe on this in a way that I feel aligned with, it's going to be, it's going to be good. So what we were talking about in the gym was mostly the idea of, of what pain is. Because if we can change the language around how we describe something, we can have conversations that are different than what we're used to having. Uh, if I can share with you, I'll, I'll share with you how we describe pain with our clients. Yeah, that'd be great. There are four terms that we want people to know, and then there are four rules associated with those four terms. They're very, very, very simple. We have to stop saying this hurts because that doesn't tell me anything. 
Uh, we've all been to the massage therapist and they've been rubbing on our back and we've been like, oh, that hurts. And they've said, you want me to stop? And you're like, no, 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 it's the good pain. I need that. Well, you have some awareness there. So where does that go in the rest of your life? How do we make the decision when we're on a walk, running, lifting weights, whatever the case might be? So the four terms are first is insult. Insult is the subconscious intake of any stimulus. Right now we feel nothing. We shift around a little bit because we felt something that something is conscious Insult just became irritation. Irritation is the conscious intake of stimulus. We need irritation to drive any adaptation at all. Right? Exercising is not comfortable. Personal development is not comfortable. We need that, that sensation to drive us in a different direction or in a better direction of the same thing. Pain is the negative emotional response to irritation. I felt something. I did not like that. It's made worse by uncertainty. So what that means is the less clarity I have around why I'm feeling this thing that I don't like, the more it hurts. And that's where it comes to like three weeks ago, I felt that same thing you're feeling right now and I'm fine. Push through it. We talk about the pro football player walking down the sidewalk with a sedentary person. They both fall down at the same time. Pro football player gets up, wipes his knees off. He's like, we're good. The sedentary person's like, I think I might need an ambulance. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of blood dripping out of my knee. You have kids, I have kids. You know, kids get a paper cut, they think their finger's falling off because they don't have experience with it. Paper cuts suck. <laughs> yeah, paper cuts do suck. Injury is a decision. It's the decision to stop. It's the decision that I, I don't want to do this thing anymore. So what we tell people all the time when they say like, I have a bad shoulder I have a, or I have an injured back, you don't have an injured back. You're standing you're able to lay down. You're able to move. What is it that your back is unable to do? Well, when I lift heavy weights, my back hurts. Okay, well, then you have a, an injury around lifting heavy weights. Now let's get more specific. Um, how do you lift them that makes your back hurt? Is it squatting them? Is it single leg squatting them? Is it deadlifting them? Is it throwing them? Like, well, Give me the real, let's get down to the granular. And what happens is you go from feeling like someone identifies that 100% of their back is messed up. I have a bad back. That's the identity that they own. And it becomes, oh, when I squat over 300 pounds, my back hurts in this way. Oh, okay. So we have a, an injury around squatting a given weight for a given number of reps. That's not your back. That's a squatting injury. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very measurable. And we can change that. I'm like, oh, shit. I don't have a bad back. No, you don't have a bad back. You're trying to do things other people don't do. Your back is telling you right now it doesn't want to do that. We can change that. And they're able to dissociate themselves from it. So ne what's next is the rules. Because next what happens is people say, well, how do I know if this is the good pain or the bad pain? Four very simple rules. If what you're experiencing is between a one and a four on a scale of one to 10, right? We have to have some subjectivity, unfortunately, in here. You're probably okay. I'm not giving medical advice that if you're feeling it as a three, it doesn't mean anything. What I'm saying is generally speaking, if you're a one through a four on a scale of one to 10, you're probably okay. Next is if it's getting better as you get warmer from rep to rep over time, then rest is not likely what you need. If it's getting better as you get blood flow to it, you're probably doing something good for that structure. So keep going. Next is let's say... For example, you feel some shoulder discomfort when you pick up a weight and you start pressing it, right? But it stays between a one and a four. <clears throat> you put that weight down. Is it gone? Is the discomfort gone? Yes. Awesome. Highly unlikely you did any permanent or significant damage there. And then last is the 24 to 48 hour check-in. Do you have a focal discomfort where you felt it while we were training? So can you take your finger and say right there? If the answer to that is no, we're good. We're doing the things that are going to help you get your progress. What that allows people to do is understand the thing I've been avoiding because it was uncomfortable that people have told me is a thing I need to do if I want to overcome this thing. I can now do. I now have permission to do that. I thought before my body was telling me to stop, my body was telling me to keep going. I dig it. Uh, you know, I think you were, you were mentioning that you helped a lot of like CrossFit people and, um, and not necessarily just to pin things on CrossFit, but mm -hmm. people that are 
people that were in CrossFit and people that are in CrossFit, they're very driven to like get their numbers better, to do these things in less time and so forth. Just as a weightlifter is with a particular weight and as a powerlifter is with trying to hit certain weights on the platform. Um, do you, like, I imagine you're helping people, but it's probably kind of despite maybe your agreement with what they're doing and how they're doing it. So how do you kind of unravel some of that? Because, you know, if, if you're just saying, hey, look, you could be healthier. There's a lot of other ways you could be healthy and you could be great, but you're, you're, I don't know what you're seeking in CrossFit bodybuilding or powerlifting, mm-hmm. but it is, it is kind of damaging you. And, and I, and you and I have to work together now for the next six months to try to unravel this. Yeah. So <clears throat> the mistake I've made in the past, cause I'd like to start there is in imposing my values on other people, which means you don't, you don't need to bodybuild. You don't need to do CrossFit. You don't need to go for your jujitsu black belt. You don't need to be sparring all the time. Like, and you don't know that they don't. Maybe they do need it. Maybe they really or, feel they do. Or maybe they're like, you're right, but I want it. So are you right. going to help me or what? <laughs> and so for me, what I've been able to start to do is before we would take on any client, before I would work with anybody, and I don't work with the clients anymore. I'm in a fortunate situation that smarter people than me with more experience and more passion for doing that work are doing it, and I get to lead them. But the first thing we're trying to figure out is what's, what does success look like for you? And why? How did you decide that that's what success would look like? When you're working with a CrossFit Games athlete, for example, it's getting back to the CrossFit Games and being able to train without pain the whole time. Mm. Well, who am I to tell them that they shouldn't do that? Okay, we can help you do that. Why is that important to you? And it seems like this stupid little question, but the why is that important to you? We like to be able to think of ourselves as a personal development company who disguises fitness and healthcare. And so what happens is, we're able to get that person to talk about things like, I never felt like I was enough when I played sports growing up. I never, like, this is the thing that brings me adoration. This is the thing that gets me attention. This is the thing that I'm using to build my business. Well, now we can have a different conversation around why we're doing it, how we need to do it, and understand it's a means to a specific next step. So I guess the answer to your question is, we will help people towards whatever it is that they're that they're looking for in an informed way. Mm. It's, it's taking the, the, the blind following of the thing I've done since I was 18 out of it. Mm. You know, I'm curious about this because like you work with a lot of trainers and I'm fairly certain you probably do pay attention to the way they put ideas forward on social media. Mm -hmm. Do you see any large problems with the ways that professionals or trainers or influencers are putting forward ideas on fitness and getting out of pain um sure. or ways that they could do things better it, it again that that would i'd have to get into their head to understand what they're trying to do and for who to answer that question in a specific mm-hmm. way about each person what i'll say is this uh the audience that i when when i think about okay that person's putting that thing out and the person i'm trying to help is buying that thing and that thing is failing them. Mm -hmm. And now they're feeling like they have a problem that can't be solved because this person said this works and there's all these testimonials. I used to look at that as, as a situation of this company is bullying this person. So I used to look at it. Mm -hmm. The way I look at it now is that thing probably works for somebody. And it might be where the person who it doesn't work for needs to start. They might need to start with the thing that costs 35, 40, 50 bucks and find that this doesn't work for them so that they can go for the next thing and then they go for the next. And, and they might need to spend thousands of dollars before they decide to spend whatever they need to spend to solve their problem. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so I used to look at that as like, ah, oh, that's such bullshit. Like you're telling people to do this thing and this thing, it, it works for somebody, but it doesn't work for everybody. Now where I'm at is I understand that I just need to do a better job speaking to how I believe it could best be done for the specific person I'm speaking to and continuously learn and find better ways to resonate with them and their problems are solved. It sounds like you do a really good job of asking questions. When uh, we went on a walk with my brother, um, he was talking about some of his pain and then you, you hit him with a question where it just got him to talk a lot, which Mm -hmm. he's good at anyway, but it got him to talk a lot and uh, it got him to like share information with you. Does that, that must be something that uh, is a strategy I'd imagine that helps you to dissect how you're going to proceed with somebody. It was 
a strategy. Now it's, it's how I genuinely carry myself all the time. You know, it, it was, I had to learn, let me back up. What I like to tell people is that you, you want to find someone who's going to ask you better questions because you already have the answer. You don't need people to tell you what to do. Uh, you need people to ask you questions so that you can decide what to do. Because if they tell you what to do, you'll do it until it stops working or until it feels uncomfortable or whatever the case might be and then move on. And I used to speak to people in a very preachy way. Like, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do this. What I learned, and it started as an intentional practice because I wasn't good at it, was just keep asking questions and it's not why seven times. It's, you said this, what does that mean? What did you, it's, it's asking people to really come to a common language so that we're talking about the same thing. And what I learned that from the mentor who I'm working with right now in a, in a tactical way, if you will, where it was, we would have conversations and it would be, what do you mean when you say that? Like, well, when I say what? When you say active, what do you mean by active? I don't know. I mean, like someone who's active. What do you mean? Well, well, I can't. And he would say, I can't help you with that if I don't ex understand what that word means to you. There's a huge spectrum of active. And so now I ask questions to find real commonality in language. And then when I want to ask a difficult question, like the ones I was asking your brother, I ask permission before I do it. What about tight muscles, tight hamstrings and tight hips? We hear that often, tight psoas. This is really pulling on your back. Uh, this is causing you, you know, th this back dysfunction and things like that. Is there some truth to some of that? Well, first of all, if I'm a, a high jumper, I want tight hamstrings. Now the question is, do I need that mitigated to manage back pain? And it may or may not be. Um, if we start out on a neurological level to begin the uh, answer, or, or not the answer, I'm not giving answers, I'm giving discussions. <laughs> Um, if we were to start a discussion uh, about that, pain corrupts engrams, pain corrupts muscle memory. All, you know, if you need proof, I, I would, when I was a professor, I would take a kid off the stage and put him behind the, and I'd stick a bolt in his shoe, or I'd uh, take a bandage and bandage up his hip or something, and then put his pants back on and you know, get him to walk across the stage at the front of the lecture hall. And everyone in there had to guess what was going on with this person because of their outward corrupted uh, pattern. So pain corrupts. It causes you to limp. Years ago, have you heard of Vladimir Yonda, the great Czechoslovakian neurologist and crossed pelvis syndrome and things like this? I have not. Okay. What Yonda proposed... And this was before he had the technology to prove it. He proposed through clinical observation that people with hip pain and back pain get, uh, he would call weak glutes and tight hip flexors. So well, I believe we were the first to measure this. Is it true? Well, not in everybody with back pain and hip pain, but certainly there were some that when you give them uh, back pain and hip pain, they don't use their gluteals as much anymore for hip extension. They become hamstring dominant. Now, again, you will see this in lifters. They, they get sore backs. And what do they do? They forget they own a pair of glutes and they go right to their hamstrings. And now they've lost half of their motors. And they're wondering, well, shoot, they start overusing their back. And now they're right back to back pain. Mm -hmm. And what was the solution? It was to wake up or bring back the gluteals into that pain-corrupted muscle memory or, or motor pattern. Now, let's go to the other side of the joint. Less common uh, was the facilitated hip flexors. But when we measured it, it wasn't the hip flexors. It was psoas. It was only psoas. So when you look at um, the uh, uh, architecture of the hip flexors, so we have the ball on the femur side and the socket on the pelvis side, this, the, the iliacus connects the front of the femur and the inside bowl, if you will, of the ilium. So it's just a uniarticular muscle. So if the iliacus flexes the hip, 
it bends the femur, but it also on the proximal side bends the uh, pelvis through that uniarticular joint. It's like doing a bench press. If all I had was pec, I would get the desired action of flexing my arm, but I would also bend my rib cage towards my joint, right, yeah. on the proximal side. That, well, that's a terrible energy leak for a bench press. <laughs> and can you imagine if all I did was uh, use my hip flexor of the iliacus, I'd walk around like this all day, <laughs> which would be a terrible stress uh, on the spine. But what we have is a psoas muscle, and now the psoas has the same approximately uh, connection point on the femur, but it comes through the iliopectineal notch and travels to L5, L4, L3, all the way up the spine. So now you anchor the pelvis and the lumbar spine, so when you fire a hip flexion, all of this becomes stiffened and stable. One, it was one of my graduate students who said, oh, it's like having a sock of wet cement. And when you activate psoas, it turns into a stiff column of cement. And uh, another little bit of trivia, I was one of the first guys in the world to have uh, an electrode implanted into my psoas. And, you know, I was fairly aware and I could activate individual muscles if you asked me to. The very first time I had psoas uh, uh, implanted, I would try and flex my torso muscles, and, and we didn't get a signal. And I'd laterally bend and no signal, and all I did was flex my hip, <laughs> electrical storm. Mm. So the psoas is a hip flexor, end of story. However, what it also contributes because of its connection all the way up the lumbar spine to the diaphragm is stiffness and stability. The brain in some people facilitates activation of psoas. So uh, with it, because of pain or because they've been sitting too long. And when they get out of the chair, the telltale sign is... Um, they shoot their hip up with hamstrings, and then they walk their hands up, and it takes quite a period of time for them to pull their hips through. That's usually a psoas, and then they'll do a, uh, a hip flexor stretch. They'll do a lunge like this or go down onto a knee and do some kind of hip flexion stretch, and they never make any headway because they are not activating, sorry, they're not targeting psoas. But I've described the architecture. Psoas connects to the femur and comes all the way up the lumbar spine. So to isolate psoas, if you could palpate, there's the inguinal crease between my torso and my femur. There's the crease. If I palpate the high middle quad, which is quadratus lumborum. Now I'm going to drift my fingers medially into the notch. That's the iliopectineal notch. So I'm going to get right on, dig deep. Now I'm on psoas tendon. I can do a lunge and I don't feel any tension whatsoever. I feel tension in iliacus and rectus femoris, but not psoas. And it's not until I, I'm just going to Sorry, I can't get full height here, but what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the lunge, but if I push my hand high up over my head, ah, oh, for the first time now, I just stretch psoas as the target. Now I'm going to drop my shoulder back just a little bit and rotate. Whoa, now I've really got psoas. Now, um, you know, we can have this discussion at a you know, a, a grade school level, or I can take you to the PhD level if you like. Do, do you want to go there? Let's get some. Yeah, continue. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so have you heard of a fella named Thomas Myers on Anatomy Trains? I have not. Name sounds okay, familiar, but... so Tom Meyer um, has done these magnificent dissections of the fascia through the body and how they create different slings and connections through the body. There is a connection from psoas up through the diaphragm across the pec and into the arm. Well, is this true functionally? 
Um, and again, I go right back to the bracketing approach to see if in this particular athlete, so if you're a 100 mile an hour fastballer or 110 mile an hour fastball in your major league baseball, I can guarantee you have a good fascial connection because if you didn't, you wouldn't have the brilliance to throw the ball. You can be, you can look really quite unimpressive. But if you have that fascial connection, you have a chance to load the spring across the hip, the spring across the shoulders, and that spring, you, you can throw 110, but you, you have to have this fascial connection. So now I'll just show you my upper body. I'm palpating my psoas. For those people, when you push the heel towards the ceiling and you spin the hand around, whoa, there is psoas tightening under my fingers down here on the psoas tendon, and now it's released. So I'm spinning through the shoulder, the, uh, the fascia. Are you getting it, uh, Encima? Yeah. You have yeah, to. Yeah, I feel um, I, Is your right hand on the left psoas? My right hand is on the right psoas. So I should put my right hand R on the... Wrong one. So it, it. It, this is like a Simon Says thing. Uh, if you were to stand up mm -hmm. and um, do a lunge with your left leg back, left right leg back. forward, right hand goes across to your left psoas. Mm -hmm. So feel the high quad yeah. drift medially into the iliopectineal notch and you'll be right on the tendon. Yep. Okay. Now you can widen your lunge and you will feel hip flexor stress, but it is not psoas. Mm -hmm. Now put your left arm over your head. And push your fingers to the ceiling quite strictly. Now, did you feel anything coming on under your right fingers in the psoas tendon? Not yet. Drop your left shoulder back just a little bit. Drop it and rotate around with it. Allow your torso to rotate with your left shoulder going back. Oh, oh, yeah. Now lean to, there you go. Yeah. Now push the heel of your hand <laughs> to the ceiling and internal externally rotate around. Is that changing the perception of psoas under your fingers? Yeah. Okay, so you have a so you have a fascial connection now. So if that felt yeah. awesome. Oh well it's it's you felt know great. this I compare this so if you're a jujitsu man uh and Sima uh, the, the, or I, I'm not going to pick on jujitsu. I'll, I'll pick on any sport. It never ends, does it? Nope. You know, I, I'm I'm mid sixties, and I'm still learning the mastery of the craft of different sports and how to tune the F1 race car. <laughs> it never ends, and it's a it's a beautiful. Uh, I, I, I don't know if to, I should use the word pastime. It's much more than a pastime. It's a total commitment. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, isn't it magical that there's, you know, something for you to start playing with now mm -hmm. and you have to decide, do you need to tighten that or do you need to release it to mm -hmm. unleash so that you're number one instead of number three or whatever. Guys, summer is here and it's time to get some new footwear. I'm not talking about these. Flip-flops suck. I used to love them, but they are messing with the way you walk and they're actually messing with your feet because every step you take in a flip-flop shortens the big toe, which can have some long-term ramifications. That's why we have been wearing our Power Sandals. And this is actually version two of our Power Sandal, which is live now at powerproject.live. It is zero drop. It has a German leather footbed, so it's comfortable as fuck. It has a Vibram sole, which is gonna last you thousands of miles to walk in. You can run, you can hike, you can walk, you can lift in these sandals. And because of the heel strap, it's gonna stay connected to your foot so that when you run, which you can literally run in these sandals, or when you walk, every step is just like if you were walking barefoot. We love these things, and that's why we've partnered with Shama to make our version two, which is much cleaner than our version one. Both versions are on the powerproject.live website, so get your new summer footwear. The power sandals. Peace. We're talking more about chronic pain. When it's acute pain, it's much more straightforward because it could be an, just a, a, you know, an acute injury is complete, completely different. Like you did a deadlift and you tweaked your back. You felt it. It popped. Like, yeah. You know, that's going to take you maybe two weeks to just get past it. You'll know. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was a muscle. Like, you can pinpoint it. You can show it. You press it. You feel it, you know. Um, 
but yeah, with, 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 with chronic pain, you might have to avoid those movements for a certain period of time. And then again, with graded exposure and graded is the key word because what do people do, right? They have an injury. They start doing their rehab exercises in the case of the low back is like, uh, a freak side plank, mm. bird dogs, dead bugs, right? Like that's mm -hmm. the starting point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I mean, for the reason why those exercises work, it's not necessarily because they're magical or because they're increasing the stability of, of your, of your vertebra or anything like that. It's just because you're changing that relationship between that input and that output. You're making your muscles tighten up and do exercise in a, in a safe uh, way in a way that's not threatening you're bringing blood flow and oxygen to the tissues you have that analgesic pain relief from just contracting your muscles in general that's why stretching feels good that that's why yoga feels good it's not because it's magical it's because it stimulates specific receptors on your tendons and on your muscles that give you that feel good sensation the problem is that they go from that back under the bar <laughs> right <laughs> and and that's the problem there's there's no um ramp up graded exposure to the movement that was once painful. So I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. You know, they go from the prehab exercises right back to where they were pre-injury. And that's a massive mistake because you have to build back that tolerance. I think one of the things that makes the prehab exercises so effective is not the actual prehab exercises themselves. It's the fact that they're not barbell movements. That too. And it gives you a good gap of time. Time, I think, and along with... Uh, Movement are probably the only two things that have any sort of real scientific proof behind them in yes. terms of pain management, right? Yeah, fuck yeah. Time and movement, that's it. There's like nothing else. Like there's not a lot of evidence of, there's uh, some empirical evidence of people saying like, hey, this I think this helped and stuff like that of myofascial release and stuff, but there's not really, you can't do like an MRI and be like, oh my God, look how much scar tissue the person had and you can't like roll it out and then get another MRI and be like, oh yeah, the, the foam rolling, it got rid of all that. You, we don't see that, right? No, dude, there's there's so many things that feel good, but don't do jack shit. So many. Um, and they might help because they might help mentally or it might make you-, you And know, that's in, right? good enough. Right, if it right. helps you mentally, that's great. You right. know, even if it's placebo. But if you are getting pain relief, that's the goal. I don't care how you get it. Mm -hmm. You know, whether you got a massage, you got cupping, you got ART, you got- But there's not a lot of science to- no, validate some of those things. No, in terms of the actual changes that happen in, in someone's body, no, there's really you can't measure there's it nothing it conclusive. No, mm -hmm. but if it makes you feel good and it if it opens up a window of time where you can train relatively pain free or with a lower amount of pain, then by all means. And it goes back to what you were saying about mobility, like stretching feels good, right? But it doesn't necessarily one lead to long lasting tissue changes. It's just it really stretching. All it is is a reflection of your nervous system, like your ability to to quiet down that muscle and let it and let the opposite side elongate essentially mm -hmm. it's a it's a marker of the nervous system but it's not really changing anything structurally or protecting you from injuries in the future or anything like that but if it feels good to you and it opens up the possibility of a training window or or even like it breaks that pain the pain signal even temporarily for an hour or two mm -hmm. it helps so i used to do a lot of um uh, mark pro like the 10 mm -hmm. system I used to do a lot of that and, and I was very aware that it's not doing anything long lasting. Like it's not necessarily fixing anything that's going on my back, but you know, for, for the, the 30 minutes I had it on and then for the following two hours, I'd feel looser. I'd feel better. You know, my back would, wouldn't be bugging me as much and I would train. So what about like, um, maybe helping correct some imbalances? Um, just example, like, um, when I do a pigeon stretch with my left knee forward, it's like, oh, okay, I can get down pretty deep. It feels good. Right knee forward, oh my gosh, like it is, you know, way tighter than the other side. But if I go a couple rounds, it can start to open up. And then as time has moved on, it like the, the tightness level has almost like caught up, you know, they're not as bad or as, um, as different as they were once in the past. So what about something like that where it's like, maybe it could be help rebalancing some of my like, um, you know, differences in my left and right side. So the same way as, as assuming that a lack of stability would lead to pain, you'd be assuming that a lack of mobility would lead, lead to pain. Mm -hmm. And it's also not a fair assumption. Like there's, I know so many people who are so immobile yet are not, are never injured. So 
it wouldn't be something that you would do to reduce the likelihood of an injury or even to, you know, for mm. anything like that. But for as a rule of thumb, I don't like asymmetries, especially if they're showing up in your movement because of what I said about the uh, direction of the force. You know, if you have a tight hip and you're squatting and you're and you're very visibly and you can feel that you're leaning into one leg more to, more than the other and it correlates with the hip that you're having issues with, then maybe I'll be like, wow, we have to find a way to dissipate the force into both hips rather than that force going straight into there. Right. I don't know how we're going to do it. Maybe it's a mobility problem. Maybe it's on your hip. Maybe it's on your ankle. You know, maybe your your spine is actually like a bit twisted, which be normal too. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, but... Always finding ways to make movement as symmetrical as possible in terms of the forces going through joints would be a good thing to do, but not something that you have to do. With the idea that, for example, there are many different types of stretching, right? But you would wonder for a specific sport, because for example, powerlifting, you need a limited range of motion to be able to achieve these movements with load. So you don't need that much mobility or potentially flexibility. Um, but with something like jujitsu and even something with boxing, you would want to be able to get into certain range of, ranges of motion without inhibition. Because when you do get into those ranges, especially, I've noticed this especially with jujitsu, and there is inhibition, that are that is places where people do manage to pull something or get injured. Mm -hmm. So that's where I wonder, like you can't say that, people don't necessarily say that stretching uh, will lead you not to get injured. But if you are more flexible, not just passively, but actively yeah. within these ranges, that will help you not to get injured when you do have to enter these ranges in competition and training, right? Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think, um, and FRC does a really good job yeah. at, at teaching that and, and giving tools to people. giving Functional range and conditioning. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really good stuff. I mean, which is nothing new. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's a physical therapy technique that we've been doing since forever. It's like contract, relax techniques. Yeah. But yeah, basically like if you are somebody that that participates in a sport that requires exposing yourself to kind of more unnatural positions and ranges of motion, not only exposing yourself to the position, but also generating force from those positions. Mm -hmm. Again, like anything, it's like making sure that the capacity of those tissues at that speed in that motion is primed and it's pre it's prepared for that. So for somebody like that, that's, that's training jiu-jitsu or boxing or, or even Olympic weightlifting, you know, with a barbell over your head in a squat position, you not only have to have the ability to access that range, you have to have the ability to stabilize that range and and to have strength in that range as well. Yes. So it's exposing yourself to that range of motion and then strengthening that specific range of motion. I always think about it as like if you if you just stretch mm -hmm. and not don't follow up follow it up with anything else, it's like typing a lengthy word document and never <laughs> clicking save. Mm -hmm the same shit like it's yeah, just a yeah. waste of time in that sense mm -hmm. you know it feels good yeah sure but like you didn't actually do anything you can't use that range of motion yeah if you enjoyed this episode which i know you did because you got this far then click this one right here because you'll enjoy this one just as much and if you're choosing to still listen to me currently as i'm telling you to go over here and watch this video well hey that just means you like the sound of my voice <laughs> and well i'll just keep seducing you right here hello <laughs>